First off, thank you all for what you're doing, which is making a difference, which will make the world a better place. But let me be very clear. We can all be doing better and much better. I've been asked to chat with you about some of the challenges of campus organizing and whether it was consulting for Jeffrey Sachs's organization or the organizing I did with Students to End Extreme Poverty, most of the principles on how I was able to succeed in these roles were roughly the same. So rather than get bogged down by the minutiae of my own experiences, I thought it would be far more valuable to share some framing and meta thoughts with you that I wish that somebody had shared with me a lot earlier along this journey. <clears throat> And I should also mention, I'm going to be honest about my experiences and my thinking around this uh, because this work attracts a lot of iconoclasts and because I think intellectual honesty is very underrated and there's actually far too much self-censorship in tippy-toeing around sensitive issues that leads to a huge number of people not optimally expending their energy and ultimately falling out of engagement. <coughs> So actually, when I started systematically going through my thinking about this and what would be most valuable for me to share and wish I, what I wish I knew seven years ago, I boiled the essence down to three main points. First, cynicism is never going to be hip. And if it seems like it is, it's because you're surrounding yourself with people that have given up and that have stopped learning. I actually can't count how many times people have gotten involved with all this stuff. And at first, they're all wide-eyed, passionate, and impatient for change, but then something happens. They get involved, <laughs> and maybe for the first while everything goes okay and they're excited to be doing something, but then as they learn more, they start to think that maybe there's a better way of throwing an event, or maybe if we could just change the way that people organize, or if we could just get everyone to work together, this could all be so much more effective. And a little bit of tension develops between the way things are getting done and the way people are going about their activism, and then it all actually follows a pretty predictable pattern. The wide-eyed optimists get involved, get frustrated about the way things are being done, want to do things better, can't do things better for any number of reasons, and then get stuck on a single minor issue, or just straight up give up, and then they spend their activism time talking down to tyros about why what they're doing will never work and how they can not make a difference. Don't do that. The psychological processes involved with the transition from idealism to cynicism can be very persuasive, and we have a lot, a lo we have a lot of strong internal incentives to give in to cynicism. Activism snobbery is a huge problem, and a lot of people naturally gravitate towards it for reasons I don't have time to get into here, but I see it all the time. Don't get in, don't give in, and I can't emphasize that enough because cynicism is never going to be hip, and if it seems like it is, it's because you're surrounding yourself with people that have stopped learning and have given up. Okay, second main point <coughs> on why we succeeded. We never stopped learning. The more you do, the more you're going to learn, and as the problems evolve, so too will the solutions. If you look back a year from now and you're thinking about an issue doesn't seem simplistic, you're doing something wrong. You might not be challenging yourself enough or pushing your thinking, or you might be stuck in a narrow framing of an issue, or you might not have enough people around you who force you forward on your thinking. Whatever it is, if you really want to make a difference, deal with it. Complex problems have complex solutions, and within each, there's typically a lot of moving parts, each with their own level of tractability, and each with their own subset of various issues requiring specialized knowledge that isn't easy to glean, synthesize, or incorporate into your own thinking. Embrace the complexity. If you're looking for a magic box to check where all you have to do is this and then everything's gonna work, you're gonna look for a long time because no such box exists. That's the nature of complex systems. So, keep learning. And think about your comparative advantage. Not just your comparative advantage, <coughs> but your, the comparative advantage of your fellow students, the organizations you're working with, and even the comparative advantage of your time. What can you do better than any other sect of society? What's the comparative advantage of students? I would argue it's time and ideas, probably not money. Getting money directly from students, even if students can cross leverage a lot of money, is gonna be limited. What's the comparative advantage of your organization? What's its purpose? What can it do better than any other group in the world? My own view is that <coughs> NGOs should run ahead of the game and show the new way forward by demonstrating pilot projects, proving unknowns, or examining underexplored approaches. Then governments and business should scale up. It's my belief that NGOs aren't going to save the world. They're definitely a part of the solution, and there's a lot of wonderful ones doing some absolutely remarkable things. But I think it's very important to understand that used optimally, they have a specific role to play, and it's not important, 
and it's important not to confuse that because I think there is a lot of confusion around what they are and are not best designed to do actually. And so why do I bring that up? Because it's important to have realistic expectations of what you're trying to accomplish, otherwise it's just way too easy to drift towards cynicism and disillusionment. The scale of the solution has to fit the scale of the problem and you need to have the right tools for the job. And then finally on comparative advantage again, just quickly, what's the comparative advantage of our generation? <coughs> of our time right now. It's technological progress that is exploding all around us that we don't know how best to harness yet. As a reference point, YouTube started in 2006, just in 2006. Uh, <clears throat> there, but we're still mainly doing campus organizing the same way it was done 60 years ago. There's a lot of underexplored opportunities there. Techno-mediated interaction is going to absolutely reconfigure the way we mobilize and disproportionately, the benefits will go to the early innovators and adapters. So never stop learning and a good rule of thumb for making sure that that's happening is looking back at the end of the year and if your opinions don't seem simplistic, you know you're doing something wrong. Last big framing thought that was absolutely instru instrumental in our success, never give up. And so let me unpack that. <coughs> If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. The world is, uh, is not gonna look as different this time next year as we would all like it to. The difference might even be imperceptible. And if you're expecting a shift in the tectonics of social justice in the next two years, we're probably gonna be sorely disappointed. If you're serious about this, if you really wanna make the world a better place, it's gonna be a lifelong journey. The, wor the world will not change overnight, and it certainly won't happen if you only try for a couple of years. So why do I say that? Because most days, it's gonna feel like you're stuck. Most days, it's gonna feel like you're not making a difference, and most days, it's gonna seem hard to understand why the world isn't doing the simplest things that would ensure environmental sustainability and save millions of lives annually. But when we zoom out and the years give way to the decades, if we never give up, we make unfathomable progress. <clears throat> Nearly a decade ago, I lost uh, a really dear friend, man, an absolutely delightful and dignified human being who brightened any room he was in and any life he touched. His picture is on my desk at home and I still think about him often. <clears throat> New data just came out the other day. In 1990, we were losing over 12 million children every year to preventable causes. It dropped to 7.6 million children last year. That's 12,000 more children living every day who would otherwise be dead. That's 12,000 kids, just like my good friend Chris. And that's happening because a lot of hardworking people, <clears throat> just like us, didn't give in to cynicism, didn't stop learning, and didn't give up. I'll be the first to admit that sometimes it's hard not to feel cynical, but cynicism doesn't get you anywhere. And sometimes when you say things out loud, they sound so wrong and so offend your sense of dignity, you know that they can't last. We're going to lose more people in the next two years to extreme poverty and everything that that encompasses than were lost in four centuries of the slave trade. Those are real people with real names whose families would weep for joy to see them alive. People just like my friend Chris. We know how to deal with 90% of the big challenges facing our planet. Don't get hung up on the 10% that we don't know what to do about. Just because we don't know what to do about Zimbabwe doesn't mean we can't stop four million disease deaths next year for an outlay of $50 per person if there was the will to do so. Paul Farmer, John MacArthur, Jeff Sachs, they all never stopped learning, and they were all in your shoes at some point. Thankfully, the people at the forefront of the great movements of human history, the abolishment of the slave trade, the civil rights movement, they didn't give in to cynicism, they didn't stop learning, and they didn't give up. And frankly, I'm kind of nervous to think about what the world might have looked like if they had. <clears throat> Canada recently lost a great leader, someone who worked tirelessly to advance the frontiers of human justice, 
someone who never gave in to cynicism, someone who never stopped learning, and someone who never gave up. He gave a letter to his partner, uh, Olivia, to share with Canadians in the event that his struggle with cancer was unsuccessful. It's written in a Canadian context, but the message, I think, transcends national boundaries and is utterly appropriate for all of us here. His last words, his message that he wanted to share with the world, his last. To young Canadians, all my life I have worked to make things better. Hope and optimism have defined my political career, and I continue to be hopeful and optimistic about Canada. Young people have been a great source of inspiration for me. I have met and talked with so many of you about your dreams, your frustrations, and your ideas for change. More and more, you're engaging in politics because you want to change things for the better. As my time in political life draws to a close, I want to share with you my belief in your power to change this country and this world. There are great challenges before you, from the overwhelming nature of climate change to the unfairness of an economy that excludes so many from our collective wealth and the chances necessary to build a more inclusive and generous Canada. I believe in you. Your energy, your vision, your passion for justice are exactly what this country needs today. You need to be at the heart of our economy, our political life, and our plans for the present and the future. Canada is a great country, one of the hopes of the world, but we can be a better one. A, con a country of greater equality, justice, and opportunity. We can build a prosperous economy and a society that shares its benefits more fairly. We can look after our seniors, we can offer better futures for our children, we can do our part to save the world's environment, and we can restore our good name in the world. Don't let them tell you it can't be done. My friends, love is better than anger. Hope is better than fear. Optimism is better than despair. So let us be loving, hopeful, and optimistic, and together we'll change the world. Thank you very much.